When we first decided um, to ask Paul Beaker to participate in this conference here with us, it was partly because he was involved in a project uh, to design a new hydrofoil ferry for Puget Sound. Um, and um, like I mentioned, his name was on the side of the boat and it got a lot of attention. Uh, we'll see that later. But that was a, um, a silly reason. In fact, uh, that is a microscopic small piece of what he's been involved in. Paul Beaker has had a long-standing high reputation designing all kinds of other boats and craft. Many are foil supported, most are not, but uh, they're both sail and engine powered. In sailboats, which is a great specialty of his, he's had 25 years designing high performance ballasted keel boats. And over the last five uh, uh, America's Cup competitions, he's been part of Oracle Team USA. A particular focus on those boats has been designing the foils and other appendages for maximum performance and also minimum weight. And he's going to show us some of that. Paul received a bachelor's degree with high honors in Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. He's a registered professional engineer in the state of Washington for the practice of naval architecture and marine engineering. Paul. From the beginning. Yeah. Hi. So thanks, thanks a lot for, for inviting me uh, uh, to give a presentation at this, uh, this talk. I, 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 uh, I've been asked several times in the past to give presentations on different, you know, hydrofoil uh, uh, get-togethers. And I've, I've generally declined because in a, in a lot of ways, I, I don't really see myself as a hydrofoil specialist. I, I'm uh, really more of a general uh, naval architect and, and um, yacht designer. I, uh, I'm trained in naval architecture, but I'm by no means a hydrodynamic specialist or a technical specialist in hydrofoils. That said, the, kind of the way my life is, or my professional career has kind of progressed, I've ended up being involved in some really interesting uh, foiling projects, which I think has explored the technology and the structures of foils and the possibilities of, of, of really high performance, efficient foils that I, I think will will have you know a lot of application in the future. Um, I think Neil was was spot on in his presentation, um, saying that a lot of the technology has has changed in the last uh, ten years with what's happened in boats like the uh, America's Cup yachts and the moths and recreational foiling craft. As Bill said, you know, my, my training is really just at a, a bachelor's degree level. I, I have been, you know, cursed or looking back at it, you could say in some ways blessed with the, uh, with the characteristic that I get bored easily. And so I've, I've always wanted to do something new. And I'm, I generally, when I, when I get bored, I, I go on to something else. The pictures you see there, you know, my, my training in naval architecture, it didn't cover anything in, uh, you know, advanced hydrofoil design, and it didn't, I had no training in composites, composite engineering, but when I got out of school, I pretty quickly got involved in these um, high-performance racing sailboats, these little two-man racing skiffs, and um, within, I don't know, three or four years of graduating, I was uh, working part-time as a commercial naval architecture and part-time in my little shop in Seattle, building these uh, little carbon fiber racing skiffs that I had designed. Really, uh, to a large degree, the rest of the things that I've, I've done in my life with uh, high performance boats, a lot of the basic knowledge that uh, I've applied, I learned with my own uh, hands and, you know, uh, working on my own boats. So just a, as a little over, uh, this is a, a little CFD run that we managed to do. This was about eight, eight years after um, 
I originally put them on the boat. We, we actually uh, were able to find somebody that, that, that uh, was willing to uh, put it in the CFD and see with uh, actual calculations, uh, the, the drag reduction. Um, so I started working on the, uh, um, uh, the America's Cup. I worked in five campaigns, the first two of which were these uh, ballasted monohulls, the ACC yachts. In the third campaign that I worked on, the billionaires invo involved uh, couldn't agree to a set of rules to race under. And so the, uh, the uh, competition went back to the original uh, deed of gift, they call it, the original rules of the America's Cup. And that was basically, it was uh, uh, a competition to see who could build the fastest boat that was 90 feet long, you know, roughly that's, that's the rule. So um, I found myself uh, working on the, uh, this, this giant uh, trimaran after uh, spent the majority of my work on, on monohulls. And um, that, as you can see, was a pretty amazingly large boat. Uh, had a riding moment of uh, 160 ton meters is four times the power of the, um, of the ACC yachts that I'd worked on before that and uh, over twice the speed. And in that campaign, I, I was forced, my, my job was basically uh, all the appendages, the engineering of all the appendages. And, and through that, uh, it really pushed my um, technical knowledge of how to build efficient and strong hydrofoils. Um, we won that competition and then we took the, the best of the two boats that were in that competition and we created uh, the AC-72 class, which was a, a 72 foot uh, catamaran with a wing mast. And those were sailed in, in San Francisco. We, by the skin of our teeth, won that event. Uh, then we sailed for um, about three years. We uh, developed a AC-50 yachts, which you see on the right there, that um, raced in Bermuda and um, kind of um, perfected the, or perfect, but we, we, we got a lot better at foiling um, there. So I'll show you some of these boats. That's a picture of the big trimaran. It was about 120 feet long on the floats. The main hall was 90 feet long. The, uh, it was a, was a pretty amazing, machine that the wing was so tall that it wouldn't fit under the Golden Gate Bridge. These were the two boats that that raced in in that competition. The as I said, the the boats that we sailed in the the uh, next Americas after that Me next Americas Cup after that was basically a combination of the best of the these two boats, the catamaran configuration from Alinghi and the wing the wing sailed rig from Oracle. Um, it's kind of prominent in this picture. You'll see this foil here up on the right. That's a foil you'll see in some of the later uh, drawings that I show in the uh, presentation. These are the AC-72s that we, that we sailed in, uh, in San Francisco. That was the first uh, big hydrofoiling boat that I'd worked on. I I'd had done a um, you know, as I said, I did the work on the, the small hydrofoils on the 14s, and I had designed some foils for um, moths by that time. But the, uh, the 72s were the first real big foiling boats that I got in, involved with. And my, uh, my responsibility on these, these boats was the, um, the structural design of the the hydrofoils and the rudders, the, the main dagger foils here and the rudders. And in those boats, we, I ended up taking what I learned in the, in the uh, trimaran and, and um, evolving it another uh, few, few steps along the way. Um, that, that race was really interesting in that um, we were, our primary competitor was Team New Zealand down in New Zealand. And about a year before the event, 
we realized that they had learned how to, to um, fly their boat on its foils. And it became clear that, you know, if we didn't learn to fly our boat in the America's Cup, we were going to learn. So we had a year to do that. And um, that was a pretty serious learning curve. You could see on the left, um, that was less than a year before the America's Cup. We, we tipped the boat over off, off San Francisco and got washed out the Golden Gate. The boat slowly broke apart. One of my, my uh, big jobs for, for Oracle then was to, um, I engineered all the, all the repair drawings to fix this boat and get it back on the water. But needless to say, we were on a pretty steep learning curve between the, that crash and, and the America's Cup event. Um, these are the boats sailing in the, uh, the America's Cup itself. Um, Team New Zealand on the left, Oracle on the right. It was kind of a, an amazing thing. You can see here the um, it kind of shows the difference between skimming and flying. You know the the, at the beginning of that event, both boats were, were um, kind of skimming up wind. Team New Zealand was probably carrying, oh, I don't know, 70, 75% of its displacement um, on its foils. Um, Lenny, one of the guys on this, uh, listening in on this would know that better because he, he did a lot of the CFD on, on Team New Zealand's foils we were carrying a little bit less displacement on our foils and, um, and upwind team New Zealand um, was a bit faster than us. So we could, we could beat them to the leeward mark, but um, um, they were generally uh, grinding us down upwind. Um, but about halfway through the event, we, we learned how to, um, to fully foil our boat upwind. So we, we not only foiled downwind, but we foiled upwind as well. And when we did that, we were then sig significantly faster than Team New Zealand upwind. And we were slowly able to fight our way back in the event and um, ended up just winning. Um, so the next America's Cup that I worked on was the uh, the thirty uh, fifth with the uh, AC fifty yachts, and those were much smaller, obviously, than the seventy twos, but they were uh, more refined in their systems, and again, their structures were just another step more um, uh, challenging. The foils got higher aspect ratio. Um, the effects of um, the foil flexing and twisting under load um, started to become um, important. In other words, the, the, uh, the coupling between the hydrodynamic forces and the flexing of the foils became something that um, um, was, was significant. Um, but the neat thing on, there's again, Team New Zealand here race again. But the neat thing on, on these boats was that they all had a fly-by-wire control systems and stored energy on board. Um, all the energy came from the humans on the boat. We had human-driven pumps, hydraulic pumps, but we could store energy in accumulators. And that allowed us to do maneuvers that you couldn't, you couldn't do on the, the 72s. So, um, the big challenge or one of the big challenges in that 35th America's Cup was learning how to do foiling tax. It took about a year of uh, evolving the foils and evolving the control systems and the board mechanical systems. Um, we got to the point where we, we could um, basically sail these boats around the track without ever touching the water. Um, and that, that was a, a pretty serious accomplishment. It, um, 
it was amazingly hard to learn how to do foiling tax in the achievement. So back to the, um, the foil engineering, I thought I'd show the first, the first kind of breakthrough or, or significantly stronger foil that, that I designed for these kind of boats was the um, dagger boards in the, uh, in the big trimaran. They had pretty amazingly high, high loads. The, the bending moment in the foil was um, 60 ton meters at the max maximum bending moment. So 30 tons out at a two meter arm, something like that, need to put it into perspective. The, um, the crushing load at, at the lower bearing was 67 tons and the shear loads between the, uh, in the core um, were, were very high. So designing a foil that was light enough that our, our, our boat um, uh, stayed inside of the design limits um, that we had for weight was a real challenge. I won't really get into the, the details of the engineering here, but to sort of put it in general terms, um, you know, we're working with high temperature cured uh, carbon laminates cured under high pressure in, a, in an autoclave. And we're very um, careful to use, carbon comes in a lot of different flavors. Um, basically, it's a trade-off between stiff materials that have um, very stiff carbons that, that have um, uh, lower strength or more flexible carbons that, that have higher strength. So one of the big things that we did is take advantage of that to use different carbons through the thickness of the foil. So um, lower modulus, higher strength carbons towards the outer surface where the strains are highest and, uh, and then stiffer, uh, lower strain to failure materials towards the middle of the foil that allowed us to, to uh, make structures that were significantly more efficient. Some of the other parts that are different about this is the way it's built, but I'll, I'll cover that in a, in a later slide. Um, if people have more questions about the engineering, I can, I can talk about that in the question area. Um, this is a example of the, uh, com some of the uh, finite element analysis of the um, of those uh, foil structures they're they're uh, kind of difficult structures to to model um, the when you get into a foil that's quite thick um, where the laminates are quite thick you need to use solid elements for the modeling of the composite and if it's curved you know the the material coordinate systems are difficult to, um, to handle. Um, uh, shear stress between layers is really important. Um, thermal stresses due to the way you manufacture the foil and the way the stress changes between when the thing's being cured at a high temperature and what's happening at room temperature. Those are all things that, um, to, that, 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 you know, you have to stay on top of the, the basic summary of what you can do is, you know, to give an example, the, you know, the, the strength of these materials is, is competitive with the best high strength steels that you can get volume for volume, but they're a fifth, the, the density. So, um, of, of steel, you know, so, it's really a, a, a game changer as far as the, the, how thin you can make a foil and, and, and how light you can make it. I thought here I'd give an example of, of um, sort of how you refine the structures during a racing event like that. Um, um, and, and so the, 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 the case in point I thought I would 
show is the designing of the elbows of the wings. So the corners where you go from the, the vertical shaft to the wing, that's a, that's a, a quite tricky area of the foil to design in, in composites. But the thing, one of the things we have to help us with that process is that um, we had a very good system for, for collecting data on the water. And this slide sort of gives an example of, of, um, of a time point, a sort of data point in a, a day of sailing. The, the big challenge is down forces on the wing. And, and so we could go back to our sailing data and, and do databases searches to find um, uh, cases of, of where you get a, a downforce. Um, and this is one of probably 20, 25 sailing events that we looked at. The, the graph on the left is a, um, a graph showing the sort of some variables uh, the, at, while you're sailing. This, this upper green line, that's the calculated um, downforce on the wing in tons. So you can see right at the time point that we are here, we, we have negative three tons on the wing. This was kind of a surprising point because you know a lot of times these downforce events were big crashes. This was actually just a little touchdown and up she went. You know, you could see from down here, this fine gray line, that's the speed. We're going along at about 35, 37 knots, do a little touchdown, go down to 30 knots and then accelerate back. Didn't really look like a big event on the, uh, um, on the surface of it, but, but it was actually one of the biggest downforce events that we, we saw that summer on the way. Um, some of these other uh, data things that are interesting, the, the, the purple line is ride height. So we can, you can see the, the crew is sort of targeting one meter, you know, he's going between one and a half meters of ride height, one meter, you know, getting close when it's zero, the hull's touching. At this event, he was basically 0.3 meters, the hull was 0.3 meters um, into the water at the forward beam. This, uh, you, know, you have the, the video to show you so the crew can remember, you know, you can go, you can walk through the event with the crew. Oftentimes, you know, having the video sort of helps them remember uh, that, that, that the, you know, what, the, when the experience was. But by going through a bunch of these events, you can decide on a, 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 a what you want to take as your maximum downforce on the wing to design the foils sections around. So you can see this is a diagram here showing what the big problem is there, is that in, in this, you can say we're, it's this part that's circled down here, the elbow of the foil. And so the, the event we're talking about is a, is a case where the wing is seeing a downforce. And so you can kind of see in this diagram on the right, you know, what that looks like. So when the, when the wing gets a downforce, the unis, the gray on the inside of the corner is in tension. And on the outside of the corner is in compression. And because the unis are taking a bend, that creates a force peeling the skins away from the core. If you peel the skin away from the core, basically the foil is ruined. If you were in the middle of a racing event and you had that happen, that would be the end of your racing event. Um, so it's pretty important to get that right. So you can see here's a, a cross section through the middle of the, of the elbow. And that's the, the, the scheme that I came up with is in the corners, I put some of the unidirectional stiffening inside the shear webs and reduce the amount of unidirectionals that are outside the shear webs. That, and in that way, sort of, I limited the amount of, of, of peeling force I could get with the, um, with the design uh, downforce that, uh, that I learned from looking at all the sailing data. So that, that, that's a pretty interesting thing is that, you know, 
when you're engineering something, especially something like that, where you're, you're, it's a new kind of sailing, you, you have to collect data because otherwise you don't really know what the, what your maximum loads are. And one of the biggest dangers is being too conservative because, because if you're too conservative, you're going to get beat by the guy that was a bit less conservative. And, and, and in fact, that's kind of what happened to, to us in, uh, in Bermuda. We, we, uh, um, the people we raced uh, were uh, a little bit more um, on the edge than we were. The other, the other way you fine tune your, your structures is, is, is through testing. The test on the left shows the, the kind of setup that I would do in, 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 in the yard prior to um, putting the boards in the water. So you can see in this in this test, I'm putting a combination of side force on the strut and force on the wing. While we're doing the test, we we you know, we have fiber optic strain gauges in in the foil that we're reading the loads out of, so we can we can calibrate the loads on the foil um, from this test. So, you know, we do the test. Not only do we we um, proof proof test the structure, but we calibrate our strain gauge so, so strain gauges so that on the water we can correlate you know, the strain gauge readings to what loads the uh, the foils really seen. The other kind of testing we do is testing to failure. Um, this setup on the right is uh, testing a rudder with a with a kind of wiffle tree arrangement that sort of puts the kind of distributed load you expect to see on the water. Um, and we take the foil all the way up to failure so that um, we can sort of fine tune that strength. This is the, the, the other side of uh, doing composite hydrofoils is figuring out how to build them accurately and without flaws. That, that turns out to be a real challenge. You know, as I said, the materials are, are amazing, you know, but each, each layer of, of carbon unidirectional is only 0.3 millimeters thick. And so there's a whole lot of layers that go into the foil, a whole lot of steps in the construction. Building the thing accurately and without any serious flaws in the, uh, in the uh, laminate is really a challenge. So being a boat, you know, having the experience building boats in, in the past, um, I think has made me, um, you know, pretty good at um, really working through the construction process of the foil. So this is a, you know, our CAD model for, for that um, trimaran dagger foil, which at that time was a was a was a new way of, of building the foil. Um, we we build the foil in a single sided tool, so basically build it up from the suction side, and we do the tooling accurately enough that during the build process, we put the part back in the milling machine, you know, on the tool and uh, do machine operations on the foil. So basically, we use the careful lofting of the materials that go into the part and um, CNC machining to get to our, uh, the high pressure side uh, contour on the foil. This sort of gives an idea of how it's built. The foil, is, the mold is on the underside of this part. The unidirectionals are laid in. Um, they're all cut, computer cut from patterns that we create um, with the CAD software so that we uh, get an accurate um, shape in the foil. So basically we stack in layers and maintain this flat surface. And, you know, with careful um, testing on material thicknesses and whatnot, you know, something like this, uh, we're, there's probably, uh, maybe 80 layers in this um, section of uh, unidirectional and will be on the order tolerances 
on the order of a half millimeter when we get through that. So we, we do the first unis, that we put in the, the shear webs that are pre-built, our, our forward, forward and aft core pieces, then we take this, put it into the big CNC mill and we machine the contour for starting our tension unis, which is the, the high pressure side of the foil. Those are pretty efficient structures. Here's um, an example of the uh, um, plies uh, cut for, for a foil like that. You can see these are the, the light blue or the, the intermediate modulus fibers and the yellow or the high modulus fibers. And um, uh, the, on the right is an example of a foil that's uh, you know, built in the, the molds. You can see sort of the topographic map of, 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 of those, those layers after they're laid down. We, we uh, lost the race in Bermuda, so um, that was that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm back in Seattle and back to doing my, uh, my uh, old work. And uh, so the, uh, um, I thought I'd show some of the projects that I've been working on um, since then. This, this was actually, we did while we were in Bermuda. Um, I worked with a guy by the name of uh, Hal Younggren and a de designer named uh, Aaron Perry. And we, uh, we designed this hydrofoil for Laird Hamilton. He's a big wave surfer on, uh, from Hawaii. He uh, pretty excited about um, these foiling hydrofoil boards. And, and he actually, um, he had a, a pretty basic one that he had been using and, and um, he, he had some good data. So we were able to, um, to design a, a new um, foil and strut for him. And that was really turned, was really an exercise in how thin you could go. Um, he, he needed to be able to go over that 50 knot barrier. This, this foil um, gets up to you know, 52, 53 knots. As you can see here, um, you know, he, can, he can ride it even on fairly uh, before the wave is really steep. So it's, it's kind of neat. They can tow into the wave. Um, they don't have to be right close to the, to, to the breaking crest to be able to to um, you know, to actually uh, keep up with the wave. This is a moth that that um, I designed recently. Uh, well, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Um, but th this boat's been quite successful, and uh, I think it's made some steps in the uh, the aerodynamic drag department, and and also had some has some nice structures in it. Um, this is an example of some foils um, for that moth. You know, at first glance, these two foils will look the same, but they're actually a bit different. The one on the right has a big, bit bigger tips to reduce the tip loading and, um, and uh, to see uh, um, what it would cost to, uh, uh, in drag to do a configuration that was less susceptible to um, ventilation. Um, that's uh, some more pictures of the moth. You can see it's pretty, pretty refined in the uh, aerodynamics. Um, I won't get into it in great detail, but the, one of the neat things in the um, America's Cup that I got used to using is, is printed titanium. And um, in the moth, um, uh, things like this rudder fitting, the, the connections between the vertical foils and the uh, horizontal foils, which are prone to splitting in, in composites. We do those with printed titanium and, and those are just laminated into the carbon structures. And um, I started doing that mixing uh, titanium and carbon back in the um, ACC yachts, the monohulls, but um, um, that's kind of evolved as the, uh, the titanium manufacturing has improved in those, um, those printed parts. Um, are, are really neat. We're just uh, just uh, sort of tapping the uh, the beginnings of the potential there. 
This is another uh, boat that we've been working on. This is the uh, Eagle 53. It has a really interesting rig in it. There's basically a, a kind of a hybrid between the, uh, the type of wings that we used in, uh, on the America's Cup boats and soft sails. So this, this wing can rotate 360 degrees. We put it in the water with sea foils. That's what it has here. The boat comes pretty close to flying with sea foils, um, but we're in the process of building T foils for that boat. And that's what these, these other pictures are. Uh, I expect we'll have that boat foiling um, next spring. So the last thing I thought I'd show is the, the, this is a, um, a foiling ferry that um, uh, concept that, um, that I uh, came up with after returning from Bermuda. Um, spending two years in, in Bermuda um, fine tuning these carbon racing sailboats and, and getting them to the point where you know, we can foil around the track without touching the water in, in you know, eight, 10 knots of breeze and uh, sort of being cognizant of how low the drag in the boats were, you know, our, our foils, we kept pushing the, uh, you know, the thinness of the foils and the aspect ratio of the foils and um, the efficiency of the boats, you know, of, a, of the foiling boat is, is, is really, you know, so clear when you're around one of the, the sailing boats. Um, you know, there's no noise from the engines. You know, you're, you, you have a moderate amount of power on tap. Um, I think those boats really work the efficiency side of hydrofoiling much harder than um, power hydrofoils have um, to date. Um, um, a, a racing sailboat can't uh, tolerate um, or you know won't success be successful if it has more drag than its competitors. So I think necessarily uh, the 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 foils end up being more uh, refined. And um, the the max operating displacement of the uh, conceptual design uh, is 48 tons. It's at 150 passenger boat. Basically, that's uh, uh, T-boat, maximum number of passengers you can carry without um, going to uh, the more stringent uh, Coast Guard uh, construction and fire suppression regulations and whatnot. Um, my focus in, in, in the hydrofoil, I think, you know, coming from my experience in the, in the sailing boats is, is not pushing the top end speed so far. Our conceptual design, we did the calculations for a 35 knot cruise speed. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up backing off to around a 30 knot speed in order to um, uh, put the props in a, in a more efficient operating zone um, to give ourselves more um, uh, margin for cavitation and um, and to reduce the power required um, for 35 knots we we require uh, just under 1400 total shaft horsepower for 30 knots it's it, it's significantly less than that our original design we just as a baseline we we looked at um, uh, direct drive um, diesels with, uh, you know, right angle gears, which we, 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 um, um, you know, are, are, you know, obviously pro problematic to, to right angle gears, but it gave us sort of a baseline weight, baseline uh, fuel consumption and, and, and whatnot. And um, so when we, we got through that stage of the design, we, um, we asked ourselves, Okay, now if we 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 put in a um, an electric drive system that that has the um, the same max operating weight, um, you know, 
what what would our range and um, uh, uh, look like? And and at this stage in battery technology, it looks like it's about a twelve nautical mile range, which which I find you know pretty ex exciting because I think that you know there's a fair amount of routes you know especially around the Puget Sound here or that are inside of that that distance. So the answer is as you get more efficient with electric based drives, that could be the difference between a boat that's practical and, and not practical. Um, you know, if this boat required, you know, 2,500 horsepower, um, you know, it would double the weight of the propulsion system. It would be a, a very different animal. We've I've been working with a, a naval architecture company in Seattle uh, for a commercial naval architecture company uh, that uh, is uh, sort of taking the lead on the uh, propulsion system and regulatory uh, work. I've had the help of uh, people like Tom Spear and Len Imus, who are on the on this this uh, in this meeting, and uh, um, you know they've been helping us with. Uh, um, some of the calculations and and we recently um, received a, a federal grant money to uh, to develop this design further so that that starts towards the end of this year it looks like is when the money starts to uh, flow for that and plan to take the uh, design to the next uh, level you know far enough that we can uh, um, you know uh, specify the uh, machinery and structure to a degree that would allow us to get uh, good pricing or yeah, accurate pricing. Um, so that's that boat. Um, so some calculations that Len Imus, it's on, it's, it's, as I said, is on the line, uh, did on, on, on Wake. Um, it's pretty neat, you know, 200 yards off the, the um, path of the vessel, I think the, the wake is less than an inch. And um, that's, uh, that's it. Anybody got any questions? In each of the uh, uh, pictures, it looks as though you've used, uh, I think that another presentation, they referred to them as the L-shaped hydrofoil uh, configuration, configuration. Is that correct? Yeah, so so these these boats we um, so the um, let's see if we can show up here. This is a picture of one of the foils from the the seventy twos. Were well, that that kind of that you see it in the test jig there. It's a it's kind of an L, you know. The cur the shaft has curve to it, but um, but it's. Uh, you know, it's basically an L shape. You can see the foil on the, the left. As those evolved, that, that picture is of an AC-72 foil. By the time we got to AC-50s, you could see the change in the, the uh, aspect ratio of the foil there. That's a real high aspect ratio um, L foil. Well, I, foil. I, I noticed different uh, configurations, but the last the very last picture was obviously an L shape. And that's why I, I asked because I had noticed throughout it had appeared that there had been C and J and L throughout the, uh, throughout the different uh, pictures. And yeah. Yeah, it's basically the, the you know, the, the 72s, the, um, they, they were fairly conservative, you know, the, um, the more, see where's, oh, whoops, I'm going up, not going down. Um, as we, so you can see here, where, like you said on that last one, whoops. So those foils, you can see it's, it's almost level when it's raised, but the, the shaft has got curvature on it. So that it that it um, that it's angled when it's extended. So you can see, sort of on the leeward side, it's got an angle. And and I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but if yeah. you looked at the wing, 
the wing is actually tilted. When this thing is extended, the wing is actually lifting a little bit to leeward. It's, 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 it's not horizontal. It's actually um, tip up from horizontal. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it gives the boat a little bit of modicum of sort of, of, of ride height stability. You know, with with changes in ride height, the boat has um, um, you know some some heave stability. It it's self regulating on ride height to some degree, and that comes at a drag penalty. So what you'll see is is as as the boats evolved, you know the um, these AC fifties. These, these boards got to the point where the wings were almost horizontal when they were extended. So you can see this, this board has an L, uh, kind of a, an S-shaped shaft. Okay. And what that meant is that when you put it down, this wing actually canted out, you know, like it, it, it ended up almost level. Um, and well, you can kind of see it here. See the strut is actually is aimed outboard, okay. and and the wing is almost level. And and so that was getting less and less pitch stable. So our 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 angle of attack control systems on the boats were getting faster and faster and more accurate. And our our crew input system was getting better. Like the the helmsman here has a twist grip. So he's controlling the angle of the foil, angle of attack of the foil with a twist grip on his hand there. And um, so that was one of the big, you know, development items is um, just from the rules, you weren't allowed to have a, um, a computer ride height control. So it was really about um, um, improving the, uh, um, uh, the the speed and accuracy of the of you know the angle of attack system for the foils. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, can I have some question? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, Mr. Paul, uh, I didn't know the yacht with fins are uh, existing. And I never see this type of yacht in Japan, but this type of yacht become a world standard in near future. Hard to say. I mean, the the, the um, you know the foiling, you know the the moss, you know these these boats, those are common now, or you know in in certain circles, you know, and the. The um, and those boats are, you know, evolved well. That the you know, um, uh, you know, they're they're well proven. Um, I think that in in the racing boats, you know, the foiling racing boats are, you know, it's a it's a it's a small world. You know, the America's Cup and there's a few other, um, um, you know, foiling. Uh, um, recreational type boats, but it is not common, but I think it is coming, but it will, not, I'm pretty sure it will not be, it will not ever be really common because it's, it's, the foils are expensive to build. Um, uh, and the, the operation is very difficult. Yeah, and and you know when you foil, you're going to be going, you know, at least twenty knots, you know, twenty five knots. When you crash, you very quickly go ten knots. So, you know, with foiling comes the potential for crashing and getting hurt. So, I think that that'll um, yeah. sort of, uh, limit the application. Well, I'll tell you. This, 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 uh, that's, for example, one of the things that this guy B has been talking about. These are the moth one. I'd like to ask you a question, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Bill Hochberger here. 
when I first went to your website, I went page by page looking at what you've done. And I was struck by the amazing variety of it. You said earlier that you get bored, you know, <laughs> do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But not only are there just many, many different kinds of designs of all sorts, but it's obvious from your presentation that you don't do just ordinary design either. You're, you're very concerned about efficiency and about lightness and it's very intense kind of design. Um, are you, do you have companies to which you can pass off a design that you've done to a certain degree so they do the, the final amount before you get it built? It seems like you need yeah. a lot more hands uh, to finish all this great uh, variety of boats. Yeah, the um, the tools are pretty neat. I mean, I, I uh, so I've always, having sort of started my career building high performance boats um, and, and using the computer to, you know, to do it more efficiently. Um, I've, I've always been pretty involved with the construction side of it. And so I usually try to work with builders who, um, you know, use computer controlled machinery to, um, to aid the construction process. So, you know, having a little CNC machine for making molds or cutting parts. And, um, and, and so we tend to, um, to, uh, um, you know, design the boat in a way that, um, that, uh, you know, you use the, the computer to build it, um, you know, efficiently. Mm -hmm. Well, a related question is, is do you have a certain set of builders who are adept at doing it your way that you normally go to? Y yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of shops now that have CNC machines and, and you know, and a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of builders, you know, understand that, that the computer is part of building things. So, um, um, there's, there's a lot of builders out there that use those tools that, you know, we, we, we could, we could work with, but, but I, I, you know, I have a few builders that I've, I've done more projects with than others. Yeah. Paul? Yeah. Hey, Paul, uh, can you comment a little bit about, uh, at least it's on my mind and other engineers, the energy absorption uh, systems that you're developing, some with All-American Marine and how you're thinking forward on this Gloucester boat um, at 30 knots and, and dealing with the control systems and et cetera. I think that's pretty interesting, um, you know, compilation of, computers to design, computers to fabricate, and also computers to fly it. Um, can you comment on that a little bit? Well, yeah, the, um, so the, you know, on the, on the racing boats, we, you know, we periodically uh, hit things, you know, debris or, um, you know, a seal now and then, um, but, um, seal. yeah, and um, the, um, and when you do that in a racing boat, you tend to break something, either the foil or the or the structures that hold the foils, and um, and subsequent to that, the foil swings back and gets a big negative angle attack. You know, if it's the forward foil that gets the big negative attack, you do you do a bow down crash. Um, if if the obstruction gets past the the uh, the forward foil and hits the aft foil, then when the aft foil swings back, it gets a down angle of attack, and and um, then the stern goes down, the boat flies out of the water and does an even more dramatic crash. Um, so you know, over the years of doing these foiling sailboats, I've I've, I've you know seen a number of of crashes. They're not you know, super common, but they, they happen. And um, so for the, 
the uh, the passenger boat, um, um, we've been working pretty hard on designing a system that allows the the foil to absorb the shock. Uh, so to be able to translate aft without changing angle of attack. Um, Got it. And um, um, I think for the um, for uh, commercial boats, I think that's a that's, that's going to be a, a, a por important characteristic um, to have. More questions, Tom Spear. Any thoughts? Um, no, not, not really. I mean, I think Paul's covered it pretty well. Um, Tom's helped me a lot over the years. The first project I worked with Tom on was the big uh, trimer. In, so. Yeah. Some of the things that have been, that he's touched on, I'm going to cover in my talk too, when we get to it, like the, uh, the mechanism for that uh, right height stability uh, that comes from the L foils. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm said, my... to... Oh, go ahead. I, I might just, uh, well, it's a question and a comment at the same time. Uh, Paul, um, Neil Baird sort of mentioned that some of the technology that's coming uh, out of the recreational and sporting arena for, for hydrofoils. You know, his, his view was that might feed back into commercial hydrofoils and uh, and potentially enable hydrofoils in future. And in a way, I can sort of see that happening with the the hydrofoil ferry you've demonstrated. You, you've obviously gained experience with foils in um, sailing craft and America's Cup and recreational. And so you can see the benefit of, uh, of hydrofoils in that context. And now I can see it's feeding back into a, a concept for a ferry. Um, I guess my question is, or it's, a, it's maybe a view as well, that like I'm a naval architect, I think a lot of naval architects think along a, a fairly narrow established view. And so if they haven't been exposed to hydrofoils, that never then enters their, their thought process for a, a future concept. What, what's your take on on how people think about hydrofoils um, in in the design community? Oh God, you want to talk about human nature now? <laughs> no, it's just, no, I know it's it's it 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 you know for sure humans are wired in a special way with respect to dealing with things that are unfamiliar. You know, like. Um, you know, I, my, my sort of big picture view on it is that, you know, people have tended to be resistant of, of, of trying new things, um, you know, because in the past that genetically, you know, has paid off, you know, like there's a danger of have trying new things and having new things not not work out and you know people that are afraid of new things you know have less of a chance of 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 of, of having something go bad than people who are not afraid of new things um but you know from my point of view you know i've sort of i think part of what i was trying to show in this paper or you know presentation was i just you know, through sort of happenstance and, you know, some chance and some not chance, you know, because I started building things, I ended up working on these hydrofoiling sail sailing boats. And, you know, I can see from the things we learned in those boats and the speed at which we learned them that, um, you know, hydrofoils in a commercial power craft, um, you know, are, you know, seem, seem like a relatively, uh, um, you know, uh, um, achievable, you know, doesn't seem like such a difficulty from my point of view. 
But, you know, the people, other people that are looking at it, maybe most of them have never dealt with hydrofoils. They've never designed something they didn't work totally sure of and put it on the water and learned from it and got better, you know. Um, you know, they haven't had that experience, you know, of going, being one year out of the America's Cup, barely knowing how to fly a boat. And by the time you're in that cup, you've evolved your systems and your structures to a degree that, you know, those boats sailed that America's Cup on San Francisco Bay in pretty windy conditions, you know, on a fairly complicated course. And I don't, I can't remember how many races we raced, but it would have been on the order of 16 or 18 races with no breakdowns, you know, mm. like it's pretty doable. Um, as far as the foils, I mean, I, it's an interesting thing about commercial boats. Um, one of the projects that I did, um, oh, I don't know, it would have been maybe four years ago. There was a, a Technocraft boat um, designed for a run from Bremerton to Seattle, a, a, a ferry run. And um, they had a foil in it that was not well engineered. Um, that broke and, um, and so we redesigned the foil um, uh, using these materials and um, basically, you know, built like one of these America's Cup foils. Um, and and that, that foil's been in service operating between Bremerton and Seattle now for, for four years without any mishaps, including they ran it up on a, on a rocky beach and it skidded up the beach on that foil and it just did, did surface damage. Um, and since then now they've, they've built um, two more of those boats with two more of those foils. Um, I could actually show you guys if you wanted to see what that thing looked like. I don't know if I don't know if I can, yeah, yeah, anyway. I can point out, Paul, that on Thursday this week, we're going to have Professor Hoppe of yeah. uh, South Africa who invented that concept. Yeah. That and so, so I guess what I'm getting at is that that boat, you know, that's that, that foil is operating under the kind of um, design loads and stresses that, um, you know, I think are appropriate for these kind of structures on a commercial boat. And, um, um, you know, it's subject to hitting logs and, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, living in seawater for, for uh, four years and, um, you know, we haven't had, had any problems. So that's, that's a pretty decent data point. Um, are there more comments or questions? I got a question. Okay, Devin, yes. Um, it seems like you have like an incredible amount of design experience, especially when it comes to performance. Uh, do, would you have any advice for a student like me who's running a project team focused purely on just performance? Uh, we're trying to build a about 17 foot hydrofoiling catamaran that's electrically powered for this summer. Yeah. Uh, obviously, our budget's not super big. So are there key things that you think we should focus on to try and prioritize that performance? Well, for one thing, you know, keep it simple if you can. Um, you know, I don't know whether you're um, what what you're thinking in terms of control systems, whether you're doing a foil configuration that's, um, you know, ride height control due to its geometry or whether you're 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 uh, going to fly it you know um, um, rather just you know the, the surface of the water that's a big you know big question um, mm -hmm. you know I think that's way more achievable than um, you know um, with with all the development that's happened in drones and and uh, um, whatnot, you know, the, the, the methodology of, of doing a, uh, you know, ride height control, you know, pretty in, inexpensively is, 
you know, that that's, that's achievable. Um, I definitely try to keep your boat light. Like one of the biggest things you can do is make it too heavy. So get, get smart about what your loads are and don't over engineer it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, enjoy yourself. I mean, the building the things is one of the funnest, you know, the most fun part. Really. Yep. And, and I like feel like, you know, that's something that is under, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, 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 it's a lot of times it's, it's, it's undervalued in our society is the, the, you know, you know, the idea is one thing, but the, like getting the idea to something that's in the water, you know, that's another thing. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a, a really important thing, you know? And so, um, you know, don't forget both things, you know, you can see things that are beautifully designed, but then just, um, you know, all the thoughts there in the design, but the execution isn't there. So the thing doesn't work. And, you know, that that's, those are sad situations. Also, it's something like that's beautifully built, but just the basic concept is wrong. You know, that's also very sad. So. <clears throat> More comments or questions? Um, yeah, Bill, I might just add to what Paul said uh, for, for Devon. Um, later on, I think uh, not next week, the week after, we've got uh, Gustav, the CEO from Candela, um, presenting on their Candela 7 um, electric powered runabout. Um, if you look on the internet already, and uh, Ray will have videos posted of that on our site in a while, but it's uh, it's a quite an elegant design. It's very small uh, struts supporting the foils. Foils are high aspect ratio, another important bit. They talk in some of their videos about what Paul has just said about keeping the boat very light, very efficient. So if, if you look at the Candela website and you look at some of their videos, uh, I think that gives you some pretty good ideas as to how to tackle um, the project you're doing. And good luck with it. Sounds interesting. Thank you. Um, Paul, if I can also add, uh, you showed early in your slides a, a foil at the back end of a monohull sailboat. Um, it turns out we've also got a presentation from Bruno Bucart. I think the pronunciation is uh, next week, um, I believe. Thursday, perhaps, we, we should check the schedule. That's uh, on the Hulbane concept. Um, Hulbane is actually, I guess, very similar to the, uh, the, the concept you showed, and it seems to have evolved from the same idea of getting better performance out of uh, displacement sailing boats in the very early days, uh, Peter Van Usenen. So you might look forward to, to watching that video as well. Yeah. It's quite a compact video that describes foil assistance to better trim the boat and recover energy from the wake uh, left behind the hull. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of potential for that. And then you think, you know, coupling that with a propulsion system, you know, like something that's, you know, sort of acting like a tail, you know, on the, anyway, there's just, you know, it's a world of what you could do. Mm -hmm. More comments or is it time to wrap up? Probably uh, the latter. Question? Oh, Takeo? Uh, yes, uh, I'm from Kawasaki and I have two questions. One right, about technical things and another one is about business things. Uh, let me ask the technical things first. Uh, could you show me the picture of the yacht, of a small yacht with a single man on board? The, uh, this man. The, the, the yacht? Oh, yeah. wait, it was down here, right? This, this thing? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, just one, just one. Uh, yeah. With a single man sitting or uh, laying. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, this thing? No, 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 no. Uh, this one, this one. Yeah. Uh, we can see some black bar at the hood of the yacht. Yeah. So that's yeah. The, the, the ride height control. So the... Um, so the basically uh, this is what they call the wand, and it 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 goes. I don't know if I could um, just show. It basically has a little paddle that touches the surface of the water, mm -hmm. 
and that has a linkage that comes back here and controls the the um, the flap on the main foil. So you have some kind of active control system? Or yeah, these, these, it's just a mechanical active control system. Is this same for, you know, all kind of yacht, like a racing yacht or uh, this kind of a thing? So, uh, you know, like a, like a surfboard shape, hydrofoil, is this mechanical or this principle same? These hydrofoils, they look like this, so there's no no um no stability there's no heave stability mm -hmm. to the boat it just it needs the the it needs this wand to control height body <laughs> yeah and so one of the interesting variables on these boats is the length of this tube here so um the more you lengthen this tube the more you uh link um uh, uh, pitch and heave, you know, the, the, um, so you can change the characteristics of how the boat, the ride height control works by the, the, the length of the, uh, the tubes. So the... Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, another question is about the business things. And uh, you know, 40 years before Boeing built 26, I, I forgot exact number, 26 jet foils, and the 15 jet foils we Kawasaki built. And uh, but now most of jet foil service is stopped. Now only Mac Hong Kong, Hong Kong Macau route and the Japan Korea route, and inside of Japan route is remaining. So that means I don't think. Well, I, I think the, the needs of demand of such a high speed marine transportation by hydrofoil is very limited, but you have new concept of hydrofoil ferry that is very interesting for us. And uh, I thought you may be uh, our business competitor in near future. And do you think such a need, uh, we will have such a you know, high speed transportation needs in the future by hydrofoil? What, what well, so, so my, my experience on the sailboats has been that, um, you know, 25, 30 knots is very easy. You know, the, the, um, the, uh, the, the foils can be um, quite efficient. Um, 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 you don't, you don't, um, you don't struggle with cavitation, um, um, and you haven't sort of the. Um, <clears throat> it's basically at about 35, 37 knots. Things start to get more difficult. You start to, you know, when you have foils that have elbows, curves in them, or you have intersections that come, you know, when you get to 37, 35, 37 knots, you start having to be very careful about the design of those intersections. Mm -hmm. And um, and by the time you're at 43, 40, you know, the, that 43, 45 knot range in the sailboats, it's getting very hard. And when you start, you know, you wouldn't notice it on a big, you know, Boeing hydrofoil with, uh, you know, or Kawasaki hydrofoil with, you know, I don't know how many thousands of horsepower available, you know, um, you know, that, um, you know, that you're developing cavitation at your intersections and whatnot. But on a sailboat, you get very aware of that. And, um, and the, the added drag from, from, from that becomes is 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 really significant. So, you know, my my feeling is that that you know, like I was saying before, I sort of have this feeling that 30, 35 knots, you know, that 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 may be a nice speed range to design for. Um, also, you're sort of in a range where conventional propellers. Are still okay, 
and um, um, for me that that that's attractive. I think it, you know you could have more you know a better efficient drive. You know I I, I think that the uh, the the water jets um, there's a fair amount of horsepower you pay for going to water jets. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think if um, there aren't more urgent questions, it's 9.15, we probably ought to. Anything more, Ray? No, uh, it's excellent. Two excellent presentations. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, I think this is going to make a great follow-up video that we'll post on YouTube. And as Bill says, we will publicize it. So Bill, go ahead and sign off. And uh, I, I'm saying goodbye now. Bye, everybody. See you on Thursday, yes. I hope.